So we're gonna jump into our second speaker of the night. She's a human rights educator and a writer, also the co-founder and the executive director of The People Project. That's an initiative to bring forth local and international community development for queer and trans folks of color and their allies as well. She's also a co-owner of the Glad Day Bookshop. That is the oldest LGBTQ bookstore in the entire world. You have seen her likely with her husband as well, Teak Milan, just showing an entire other side of black love and relationships that is not often presented in the media. It is my pleasure to welcome Kim Katrine Milan. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I actually, I just had a baby three weeks ago. <laughs> and she's up there somewhere with my husband also. This is actually the longest I've been away from her. <laughs> oh, y'all are pointing, you can see. Obviously, he's like a tall, tall man with a tiny baby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it means so much to me to be able to be celebrating her and thinking about, you know, historically how me and how we came to be here and came to exist, and also thinking about the legacy I'm passing on to her. Now I'm like really obsessed with this idea and I think it's really beautiful because I think for many black people in general, there's no time, nostalgia is kind of a dirty liar that says things that were, were better than they were because there isn't really a time for us where we can be nostalgic. I'm not super excited to go back to the 60s. I'm not really thinking about, wow, how fun would it be as a black woman to be in the 30s? you know and as a black queer woman with a family with a baby with a partner with the right to marry again these things are not something that come from my past and are very much the fruit of the work that we bring into our future so thanks so to share a little bit of how I came to do the work that I do and how I came to be in the place that I am, um, I often tell this story that, you know, I came to Canada, like many, many of us, as an immigrant from Trinidad. Um, yes, Trinidad, I'm sure there's lots of us in the house. That's all good. Um, and like many Trinidadians, because of the way that the diaspora works, because of the way colonization took hold across the Caribbean, I have a very mixed race background. I'm black and I'm also Indian, I'm also Arawak, also Venezuelan. I grew up in a household where I was hearing Hindi and Spanish. So it was always an enormous kind of diversity that was very normalized in my life. And it was really only when I came to Canada that I started to feel the pull in the ways that they want to fracture those kinds of identities. And so often I've responded that, you know, I'm not fractions, I'm layers. I'm all of these things at the same time, and blackness reconciles all of them. They don't feel confusing or difficult or hard to live them, but rather the ways in which we are so often asked to represent only small pieces of ourselves is what makes that process most difficult. When I first came to Canada, my mom is a librarian and I grew up in the public library. And I think that for me, that was really what rooted me in an understanding that education could be flexible, it could be culturally relative and reflective, and it could be malleable. I watched my mom design programs for children around literacy, working with babies all the way up to teenagers. And the one thing I noticed consistently was was that every time education reflected the people who were learning, people got excited about learning. And I was in a library, so I didn't feel limited by any kind of knowledge. I could sit in the stacks for weeks and days at a time and explore so many different kinds of learning. And I think that this created a very different relationship with me, with school, with learning, and made me really realize that I wanted to be a part of that process for so many other people. So once I came away from that experience, I began getting really invested in nonprofits that were working around education, and in particular, really trying to find opportunities to meet people where they were at. You know, I was in high school and I remember how many people how many people struggled with their experience of learning and how many black children were pathologized because of the ways that they were bored in class. They wanted to learn more and they wanted to be engaged more, but consistently I would watch as educators and school systems would fail them and ignore them. And I knew that there was a way to do this differently. 
And I think also in coming into myself as a queer woman, it also made me realize how we are never reflected in curriculums. I do this activity often with my students where we, we ask each other, who did we learn about in history? And often, no matter where we've grown up in the world, we've all learned about the contributions of men, particularly the soldiers. History doesn't often start until the soldiers get here. And so often, <laughs> As a result of that, we don't learn about what women were doing. We don't learn about what indigenous folks were doing, what disabled communities were doing. We only learn about one very small sliver of humanity. And that often creates this idea, this mythology that we were not here, that we're brand new and far from it. And so continuing to do this work, I really began when I started the People Project with my partner at the time, it was really about creating a space where knowledge and equity would meet, where we would be honest with young people in really intentional ways about the work that we were doing, and where we would also be supporting other initiatives throughout the city in the ways that we want to pay things forward as often as possible. And I continued to do that with the work that I was doing there, and also the Glad Day Bookshop, oldest LGBT bookstore in the world, a community space where people could come together and again, see themselves reflected in that kind of learning. And I did it in everywhere I could. I did it in arts, in curating different spaces, um, on different stages across the city, and also in yoga. I teach brown girls yoga. <laughs> I teach yoga to people in our community so often because I think that health is a big part of the way that we learn together. And today, I am honored and lucky to be able to go around the world and to speak to so many people, to have opened for the likes of Cornell West or hosted Roxanne Gay when she was just here this summer, and get to connect with people again around this idea of and intersectionality, equity, and knowledge. And I think that, again, as community members, as black folks, we have a responsibility to teach each other the stories of people we don't often hear, to acknowledge the experiences that have made us the people who we are, and to create a community and a culture that is more ethical than the one that we were born into. Thank you so much. All right, another round of applause for Kim Katrine Milan.